Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Valerie DiMartino. I'm part of the networking uh, marketing organization here at Citrix. Um, we're very excited to have you join our session. This is SIN 119. Um, this is about ADC and AWS and the advantage of having those two uh, products work together in a hybrid multi-cloud scenario. Joining me today is Tommy Neubauer, Senior System, Ad Senior System Engineer for Pilot Flying J, and um, we're very excited to get started. So first of all, if you would like to tweet, you're welcome to do that with these hashtags. And also, just a quick um, informational piece, or piece of information here for you with some of the changes that we're making that you may have heard about. We will be dropping the NetScaler from the uh, brand in the, in the near future. So uh, please um, know that we will be still, still be referring to it as Citrix ADC. And also we have um, the management analytics system that we'll be talking about here as well. And that is gonna be uh, changed to application delivery management. So if you think of ADC, you can now think of ADM in the future when we do make that change. All right, so I wanted to just sort of get an idea of how many people here are, are you know, moving to hybrid cloud at this time. Okay, and with AWS? Yep, okay, great. And um, I guess the rest of you are probably just considering it or looking into different options with your cloud, of course. NetScale or, uh, or Citrix uh, offers you the choice of cloud, which is one of our three tenants that we've been talking about at this event. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the concerns that you might have when you're moving to the cloud uh, or moving to a hybrid or multi-cloud environment. The first one might be infrastructure and costs, infrastructure uh, investment or cost, that comes to mind, um, especially around hardware. Oh, sorry. Um, the second one might be application visibility across these different disparate environments um, and you know, how are you going to be able to see when issues come up I apologize, it's a little sticky. Um, the third one might be application and user security, um, making sure, especially remote type employees, um, have that secure access wherever they are, um, and that you have also layer seven application security as well. And the final one um, that we're gonna the cover in this session is really around availability now that you have um, multiple environments to um, cover. So first of all, I wanted to just have Tommy come up here and talk to you a little bit about himself and what Pilot Flying J is all about. So Tommy? Yeah. Thank you, Valerie. So as Valerie mentioned, I'm the Senior Systems Engineer for Pilot Flying J. And um, I kind of want to introduce you to, uh, to Pilot Flying J to start out. So we are the largest uh, network of travel centers across the country. Um, we operate in both the U.S. and in Canada. Um, we have around 750 locations in North America. Um, we, uh, we are going to be majority owned by Berkshire Hathaway by uh, 2023. They have just recently placed a large investment and now own um, just over 30% of Pilot Flying J. Um, we generate uh, a little bit more than uh, 20 billion in revenue every year, um, and so you know, we have to we have to protect all of those transactions, um, and and we do we we do front end uh, some of our applications with Netscaler as well, um, primarily our mobile app. But we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, a little bit later. So, Tommy, I know you have. Um quite an extensive history with the NetScaler. So could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, your history with the NetScaler and how you've sort of evolved that into the different form factors? Yeah, so we started out um, with uh, VPX 200s and that really kind of started our journey into uh, the ADC world. And it was really meant to just be our, um, our gateway for Zen App and Zen Desktop. And I think a lot of people kind of start their journey that way. Um, and then they kind of start learning that that NetScaler can really do a lot more than be a gateway, or even just more than just a load balancer for that matter. Sure. Um, so we rapidly transitioned into uh, an MPX, um, deciding that we needed, uh, needed to leverage some hardware acceleration for SSL transactions. Um, 
and then from there we, we moved over to the SDX world because we needed some logical separation for some of our PCI compliance um, as well as just ease of management and making sure that, um, that, that we had those kind of segmented out and we, we weren't putting too much in, in any one instance. Um, so we decided to move uh, to um, AWS relatively um, recently, but we've made that, that journey uh, pretty quick. Um, so we decided up front that we would do this as well with, um, with NetScaler, partly because of our, you know, really what we've gone through on-prem. Yeah. Um, and I think you looked at Azure um, quite a bit, and there were some advantages that you saw with AWS. We so. did. So um, with AWS, we saw a lot more maturity, and um, really it was kind of the name of the game for us was around, um, was around speed to market. Um, it, it's not so much about protecting that, um, that, that capital investment for us as much. Um, so AWS really started to kind of make sense to try to get the, um, the, the end user what they needed and get that, um, get that out into the market because every day that we, didn't, we don't have that advantage competitively, we're losing out, right? Um, so we saw the maturity in AWS and NetScaler working together um, to, to kind of bring that to fruition for us. Um, so, um, let's see. You're not wrong. This clicker is a little sticky. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize there. for that. Yeah. Um, let me You're see. Just... I can just uh, yeah. help you out. So, so, like I mentioned, we, did, we decided to do uh, NetScaler kind of up front and make sure that we kind of got ahead of that curve instead of uh, relying on kind of just using, you know, the, the load balancer in, in AWS. So, so, so yeah. yeah, you, you um, also had a consideration of whether to use the native load balancing functionality in AWS, which is their elastic load balancer, versus, you know, a more uh, mature ADC with a lot more functionality um, and robustness. So, Right. You, you did make that choice very initially. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we've, uh, we've had a lot of flexibility around um, leveraging NetScaler to kind of bring things to market uh, as, as quickly as possible. And with that flexibility, we knew going into AWS that we wanted to bring that kind of with us. Um, we might not always be in AWS, so bringing that logic with, with us um, and that management capability that NMAS gives us um, really kind of made sense. So we made that decision very early, really before we even moved into the cloud at all, um, because we wanted to make sure that, uh, that, that we had those, those benefits. Um, also, if you look at ELB, you can't, you can't load balance stuff back home with ELB, right? That's, that's not going to work out. Um, you probably could try, but I, would, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, using NetScaler ADC really kind of incurs less technical debt for us, right? It's, that's all the stuff that you're going to have to come back and fix later. So if you keep piling on that technical debt, eventually that's going to that's gonna come due. And if you were to use something like the ELB, um, you're going to have, you're going to have to rewrite it someday. Um, and you never know what AWS necessarily is going to change without even notifying you. So, um, or you know, maybe it comes in just an email that you miss. So you know, NetScaler gives you kind of that, that stateful mindfulness of, uh, of what your, your technology stack looks like. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, planning for the future in case we move to AWS or move from AWS. Just in the same as, you know, moving hypervisors or, um, or any other change in our tech stack, um, we need to be able to have that flexibility to, to have a hybrid cloud, have it on-prem or in the cloud or multiple clouds. Um, and, and NetScaler definitely gives us that capability. Um, so once again, long-term exit strategy for, for AWS. If necessary, I always like to have an exit strategy. When I go in and invest in any given technology, I want to know that I can, I can back out of it, I can move. You know, we, we started out with hardware, right? We needed to be able to migrate. 
Heck, in our ADC journey, we started out with VPXs. I had an exit strategy of being able to copy that config and move it over to an MPX, which I still have that whole config like moving around now. Um, so it's, it's really about having that flexibility to move things. Um, and so it really incurred a lot less technical debt for us to, uh, to, to, to bring that to fruition. So Valerie, I'll let you go ahead and talk a little bit more about um, app delivery considerations and the hybrid cloud. Um, sure. Great. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. OK, so let me just build this out. Um, so first of all, um, when you move to a hybrid or multi-cloud environment, it's definitely going to increase that complexity um, because you have these different environments. And IT is their main function now is making sure that the applications are always going to be available. So how do you do that going forward? IT needs to take that um, the secure lockdown environment that they get with the on-prem data center and marry that with the flexibility and agility that you're going to get with the public cloud. So IT really needs deep knowledge, um, not just keeping the lights on, but really deep knowledge to do this. And you're managing now multiple technologies at different levels of, of abstraction, from identities to SaaS SLAs, to scaling servers in the data center, to serverless functions in AWS. Um, basic load balancing is probably not going to be sufficient in a hybrid or multi-cloud environment. So that is something that needs to be definitely um, broadened across different environments. Um, Offloading of intensive server tasks is something that also still needs to be considered, um, even in uh, moving to a hybrid cloud type of environment. Um, and then, you know, global server load balancing, um, business continuity, disaster recovery, redundancy, these are all things that need to be considered. And Valerie, if I, if I could go ahead and interject just a little bit. Sure. Um, one, one main benefit to, uh, to running some of this in Netscaler is that you get to manage things that are above and beyond just the load balancer, right? You can manage now WAF with, with one policy set across the board. So you're not stuck right. into AWS's WAF. Okay, cool. I've got my policies in AWS. Now, what about the rest of, you know, where I want to front end, the rest of my data centers? Is it going to happen on-prem or in the cloud or is it across multiple clouds? Now I have WAF policies freaking everywhere. Spread out. Right? right? So that's, that's a huge deal uh, to, to us as, as a customer um, to make sure that we're managing some of those extra features that, that the ADC really gives us. Sure, sure. Yeah, and the ADC, you know, really uh, prevents you from needing any point solutions. It does a whole lot including um, a lot of centralized management, which we're going to touch on. Um, so again, you're going to have, uh, in a hybrid cloud environment, you're going to have different silos, different form factors, different locations. Um, and you're going to need to make sure, first of all, that your users can access their applications securely on any device from any location around the clock. Um, you want to also make sure that you can um, identify any kind of issues. Um, if you lack that visibility to do that, you're not going to be able to A, meet your SLAs, or B, keep your users happy. Um, if you go into point solutions, you're going to need them for all different types of things, including performance, security, load balancing, and on and on and on. And you lose that ability to have that single pane of glass to do your management. Um, what about if AWS has any kind of outage or even the Netscaler has um, any kind of an issue? What kinds of redundancy and um, failure mitigation do you have in place to make sure that, that those applications are 100% available all the time? And then we have this new um, microservices architecture, which is adding complexity. DevOps is breaking down these applications to get them to market much quicker so things are moving at a much more rapid real-time pace. So that's another challenge. And then finally, hardware cost. How are you going to anticipate that additional environment and how much hardware you're going to need to purchase up front? Um, that's another thing. So what you need is a new application delivery approach that's going to address these challenges. Of course, 
NetScaler um, ADC is going to help you with that. Okay, there we go. Um, so first of all, it's going to give you that SSL VPN. That's going to give you that secure access for your remote users. That is going to make sure that they're always being able to access any type of application, not just your Citrix virtualized applications, but your web applications, your SaaS applications, any type of application. Um, what about you know offloading? We talked about those server intensive um, of things, tasks. Um, what about having you know the ability to offload that SSL traffic? Um, what about the ability to do caching and compression? Sort of the basic tenets of ADC. I kind of want to jump into sure. there because that's that's something that I think is really important that a lot of people might not even realize if, unless they've done it with some of the caching, compression, and, and offloading of that side of things. Is all of the or, or a lot of those anyway, like your caching and compression, have policies tied to that. So there's actually some logic that's involved there. And if you end up having point solutions and you're having to re-engineer that every time, it's, you're going to have a lot of additional work and rework really. And that's kind of what we're trying to get away from with even with DevOps and, and all of you know all the new methodologies of trying to trying to move things more rapidly. You want to you want to mitigate that rework. So I think Netscaler really kind of plugs right in there for us. Yep. Lots of integration, um, third party integration and automation. That's what it's it's really about. Um, you know Flexible licensing, we're going to talk more about how you're going to be able to save a ton of cost um, rather than having to over-purchase um, capacity that you don't even know if you're going to use um, even in the near-term future. So um, we're going to talk about how you can mitigate that as well. And then uh, visibility. Um, we have quite a lot of analytics that you've heard about. Um, you can go ahead and try NetScaler Mass right now. It gives you a whole set of insights that we're going to talk about in this presentation. Um, it measures the application health, the usage, um, network latency, all different types of things that you can see in there. And for those who haven't moved into the cloud yet, you do lose a large degree of, of visibility when it's not in your network anymore. And so the more places you can add visibility, like, like NMAS, it, the better off you're going to be. And the answer is not point solutions. Right? No, no. <laughs> or well, caps. And there are many. You can buy point solutions all over the place in right. the marketplace. But sure. um, yeah, I would advise caution with that. Right. And then we have lots of dashboards that you can use for managing your fleet, managing your application usage. Um, managing your SSL certificates, you know, what's the um, usage of those, you know, how can I make sure that they're not about to expire on me, um, and then, of course, different types of security policies for um, application threats that are happening all the time. So, Tommy, um, back to you on some of the features in Netscaler that we're going to go into on some of those. Yeah, so, um, let me see if I can just go ahead and populate this slide. <laughs> Maybe. Especially since the clicker doesn't seem to want to work with very well for us. All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, kind of the, some of the features that Netscaler gives, but really what we've uh, what we've realized is kind of the the benefits of um, of of that control that you get between NMAS. Pooled licensing has given us a lot of flexibility, and that's really, for us as a customer, was what a lot of it was about, is, is maintaining that level of flexibility that we've come to know in the data center, but being able to take that to the cloud. And pooled licensing kind of further helped us with that, um, where that I can go ahead and, and buy the capacity, but not make that hardware investment. Um, so. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be in AWS forever. I don't know what workloads necessarily I'm going to put in AWS versus on-prem all the time. But when my boss says, hey, you've got to make a purchase for the next three years because I don't want to cut another PO, cool, I'm going to go ahead and buy pooled capacity because I have no idea where it's going to go. Um, and I'm, I don't want to go and make that investment in physical hardware that, well, it's not like I can take an MPX and go stick it in the cloud. Um, so I need to know that I have a flexible model, and that's that's really a huge thing that, that Citrix and, and Netscaler has given us. Um, so of course GSLB has helped with that tremendously, where we don't have to worry about if AWS goes down or some piece of it, you know, is is not available. Um, you know, if 
if their DNS isn't functional or, or anything along those lines, it doesn't matter. We've, we can still keep pieces of that on-prem with GSLB and then front-end the rest of it um, with, uh, in, in AWS as well. So we're redundant across the board. Um, that, that keeps our downtime uh, from creeping up. Let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. We have two SDXs. Um, well, if you count our primary data center. So we've got four SDXs total. Um, and then uh, so there's uh, 20 instances per SDX that we have on-prem. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Nitro? Um, yeah. And how it's API first, you know, built from the ground up. Yeah, so with DevOps becoming a larger piece of what we're doing at Pilot as well and making sure that that, that infrastructure is, is basically infrastructure as code, the API first mentality for, uh, for NetScaler has been a, a really strong benefit um, where we know that we can, we can enforce those policies um, and we can put them in code and hand them over to our developers um, in, in the form of you know, either style books or just the, the, uh, the Nitro APIs for the NetScaler and make sure that, um, that they're really able to reproduce what they're going to experience in, um, in production. So, um, so that's, that's really huge for us to be able to, um, to operate in a repeatable manner. Um, and, and the Nitro APIs definitely help making sure that that's, that's always available. There's not going to be a feature that I have to worry about that it's like, oh, well, I can do this through the GUI, but I can't do it in the APIs. So it, it's, it's a huge win for us. Yeah, so to, to that point as well, um, NMAS adds that ability for us to kind of go through that, that repeatable process and me to hand a style book over to, um, to a developer who may not even really be comfortable with, um, with Netscaler, but give him a YAML file that he is comfortable with editing and, and be able to, uh, to plug that in is, um, is, it kind of brings the learning curve down to a lot more manageable. Uh, level. So let me just make sure everybody understands um, what we call, what you guys call templates, we call style books in Netscaler Moss. And these are uh, YAML based um, declarative syntax. So you're, you're saying what you're hoping to achieve in those. And um, what's great about that, what Tommy's going to talk about, is how that can go across your entire development life cycle. Right. Yeah. So. Um, YAML also is really easy to read. It's not like, so if anybody's familiar with JSON versus YAML or any, any of the markup languages, some of them can be a little bit more difficult to read. YAML makes that really easy because it's, it is human readable. Um, I'm not a developer and I can read them. Um, but that way you can go ahead and create a style book that you can go ahead and deploy across um, development QA, and then into production. And it's going to happen the same way each time you deploy that. Um, so this kind of goes back to that whole idea of infrastructure as code, um, where if you're, if you're able to codify that infrastructure, now you can actually promote that, that change through the entire, th that entire process and entire pipeline without really having that much human intervention, especially by the time it gets to production. So you're able to to repeatably QA and uh, and test all of your uh, all of your changes, and and then also check it into uh, to source control. So now rolling changes back is a lot easier. Um, so you know what changed along the way, who made the changes, who checked them in, um, and and so that that to me is is something that that you can't get a lot of other places either, and and brings a lot of value. Um, in shortening that feedback loop as well, where the developer doesn't just throw it over the wall and, and kind of wonder, um, you know, what's going to happen in two months when QA finally gets to it. He knows that it's probably good. Um, and so with also with the templates, you're able to do a lot of the configuration tasks um, and make those really repeatable as well as application delivery. So can you tell us how that was really important to save you time? Yeah. So. The, the repeatability just kind of adds to, uh, to, to you know, that shortened feedback loop, right? Um, and so now, even if I'm doing a deployment at 
you know, 2 a.m., I don't have to be very coherent. I know that I can, I can <laughs> go is, ahead right? and, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, and I don't want to mention how many times I've had to do a deployment at 2 a.m. And there's not a developer to be found. It's weird, actually. We're both up at 2 a.m. because <laughs> we have little ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the value is, is tremendous, right? Because sure. if, if, if you're able to make that repeatable, we don't have those issues where um, now I need to wait for eight or nine o'clock for the developer to stroll in and, and I can go, dude, what happened? Um, so yeah, the, the, it's just a tremendous value for us. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, so um, back to Moss a little bit. Um, again, on some of the analytics that are in um, the product. So first of all, Okay, there we go. Um, if you are using Zen App or Zen Desktop, you need to be aware of the HDX Insight capability. That is going to show you all of your latency, um, all of your ICA traffic across the environment, outside the firewall, all the way from the end user, all the way to the server. It's going to show you your WAN latency if you're doing anything with a WAN network, um, if you have remote offices. Um, it's going to show you host latency. And, you know, it's really important for IT to keep their help desk um, SLA is pretty low. Make sure that users um, get their issues identified very quickly so they can go back to being um, productive in their work. Then we have um, Web Insight, which will identify um, user and server response time, as well as HTTP errors, you know, the 500, the 404 errors, things like that. Um, our gateway insight, if you do have remote users, you will have the gateways set up as part of your NetScaler, hopefully. And this will give you all the information that you would need to know about your gateways, as well as any user uh, login type of issues with single sign-on, uh, passwords, things like that. Um, and then we have a thing called endpoint analysis, which is going to uh, look at their device and make sure that it is um, compliant and be able to access um, the in internal network, things like antivirus and things like that are important. Um, and then we have a whole dashboard for SSL certificate management. Again, this is going to make sure that you're keeping track of all your SSL certificates, their usage, and when they're going to expire. And you will be able to set up alerts through SMS or email for that so that you don't have to sit there in front of that and watch it. Um, so I just wanted to say that AWS and um, and NetScaler bring you that sort of unification that lowers the barrier to your hybrid cloud um, deployments as you move to them. Um, yeah, have to just build it all out. So again, with, the Nets, with NetScaler Moss, you're going to be able to see all of your NetScalers in a single um, dashboard. You know, you have a geography view of that as well. Um, you're going to be able to do um, monitoring and threat detection um, with your, you know, layer seven applications. So zero day attacks, things like that um, are very important to be aware of. Um, and then we do include the web app firewall in with the NetScalers. Um, SSL certificate management, we just mentioned that as well. Um, and then integration with third party orchestration systems for SDN like um, VMware NSX. Yes. <laughs> The SSL certs? Yeah, um, I, I think you can. Um, uh, you, I know that you can assign uh, groups and um, and you know tie it into LDAP. Um, so I, I, I haven't actually done it, but it's got basically the same level of control. Um, if, if oh, you can sorry, tie, if, I, we should have repeated that. I apologize. Can end users manage their certifications? Oh, okay. Right. And so we're trying to push it back on the applicant to manage it themselves. Because technically it's their cert, right? Right. So application teams. So technically it's the end user that's supposed to be the only one that's running the net scaler. Because the net scaler, I mean, potentially you can block them off. Right. Security groups and stuff, it's just a matter of how much training do you want to spend with them to teach them how to do it and do it correctly. Right. Correct. You name command ops on the load balancer, create a profile. So they have an account that has command ops that allows them to access SSL certificates. 
Yeah, you'd, you'd manage that through NMAS, and you'd, you'd do the same user groups type policy in, uh, in NMAS. So, so if I have one app, you know, I can put that app in a certain profile so that you only have the Right. Yeah, and, and I'm kind of making an assumption that you can that you can do those same profiles on uh, on Maz as you can in the Netscaler, um, but okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, yeah, sure. no problem. It's Great. it is it is going to be something that you have to watch and make sure that your naming schemes uh, in your VIPs like stay the same and don't overlap. Um, so. Great. Yeah. Um, so again, I was talking about some of the orchestra, you know, third-party orchestration that we do um, with the cloud management platforms, um, OpenStack, Kubernetes are some of the examples there. And then um, again, the workload automation is, is very key. Mass is all about helping you automate, save IT time, um, you know, from having to do repeatable tasks, of course. So again, check out the style books, which are the templates. And then just a little bit about pool capacity in case you weren't aware of this. You can buy these pool capacity net scalers. Um, you can upgrade from your existing net scalers now as well. Um, and you can pool your bandwidth and your instances into this common pool. And then you can allocate that into your net scalar environments across your different form factors, across the different locations, so that you are um, only using the, the bandwidth where and when it's needed. So it really gives you that portability. It lowers that barrier to the hybrid cloud. Um, so for instance, here you're seeing that they're moving that 50 gigabits across. So it's checking out from the pool that certain amount that you've allocated it to, and it's moving it across your environment. So you take all those, the, that bandwidth and pool it together. So Tommy's going to talk a little bit more about yeah, that. So Pooled capacity definitely helped us out, kind of like I mentioned earlier, where we, we didn't have to, um, to really make a capital investment in, um, in infrastructure as much because, um, because we had that option for, cool, for pooled capacity. Right? I don't need to go buy a whole bunch of SDXs to, uh, to, to lifecycle my hardware, especially when we're in the middle of a, a transition to the cloud. It doesn't make any sense. But I still, I had, you know, my, my boss actually asked me exactly that, you know, how much, how much capacity do I need to buy so that I, I don't need to, to do this again in, in three years? And it's like, well, you want me to basically tell you exactly where the entire industry is going for the next three years. And I'm not about to do that. So what, I did, what we did was we ended up um, looking at, uh, at pooled capacity as, um, as really kind of our best option because I don't have to pick where the applications are going to go. I don't have to figure out where the developers and their development teams want to put their applications. If they want to put it in AWS or if they want to leverage some Azure service that's not available in, um, in AWS, I don't have to make that decision now. Um, and God only knows what they're going to want to do in the next three years. So it, it absolutely makes sense to have that, that level of flexibility. It also saved us a lot of money, um, right? Because now I don't have to go buy a physical box. Um, so for us, it really did save us about 60% um, on some of our life cycle costs. Now I don't have that sunk cost hanging out in hardware that's depreciating and, and losing its value that I'm, I know I'm going to have to rip out. So that net scaler that I deploy in three years with that pooled capacity isn't about to go EOL, right? I didn't just go buy a... A, a SDX and I have spare capacity hanging out. Um, it's, it's just like manufacturing to a certain extent where the, if I've got to hold three years worth of inventory and I know it expires after three years, what, you know, that, that third year I'm pretty screwed really. Like I'm, I'm watching the clock. So you really, 
this gives you that flexibility where that third year is just about as valuable as, as the first year you deployed it. Um, so that's, to me, that's a really strong value proposition to, uh, to have going into, the, going into that third year. I know I can go ahead and, and deploy that with the confidence that everything's, um, everything's just as valuable as it, as it was on the front end. Um, so uh, I, I, wanted, I want to touch base on kind of why NetScaler really makes sense as well for, uh, for us with auto-scaling groups. This was, this was huge. Um, without the automated ability to handle auto-scaling, we would lose a huge capability to keep our, co our costs under control in the cloud. Because it's, it's really why we want to move to the cloud anyway is because I don't necessarily know what capacity I need. Um, so auto-scaling groups help that in AWS, but NetScaler is able to sit in front of that, um, that auto-scale group so I can say that I want two machines, and I always want two machines front-ending front my, uh, my website, but I want it to be able to expand up to 20, right? Um, so in the middle of the day, somebody decides to, uh, to do something like, um, you know, get acquired by Berkshire Hathaway, and marketing doesn't tell IT. Hi. Uh, yeah, totally happened. Called, uh, called up my PM that wanted to do a website deployment that day that we were announcing our, um, our being acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. And it was going to take the website down. I didn't know this was happening until 8 o'clock when I opened up my email. And I have an email saying, by the way, here's the announcement that you're about to see on the news. And completely awestruck as I was, this is kind of what the cloud gives us is where, one, we shouldn't have been doing a deployment that day, but two, I also have the capability in the cloud that I don't have to worry about, did marketing tell me that they're going to go drop some bombshell like that on me? Because um, I know the capacity is available. And with auto-scaling groups and, and NetScaler in front of that, um, I'm able to handle those, those changes um, and those curveballs. So um, I want to kind of run through uh, a quick demo real quick to show you guys kind of how easy it is really to set up auto scale groups as well. Um, so we're going to play a quick two minute video. Um, and, uh, and then In this video, I'll yeah. show how to use the Amazon Web Services to auto scale on the back end when load balancing with a NetScaler VPX. This solution builds on several different components. First, you'll need a NetScaler VPX instance on AWS. Next, you'll create an AWS autoscale policy or group that you'll need to add the VPX into. Then you'll create some policies for the IAM role, specifically autoscaling and integrating with the SNS and SQS features of AWS IAM. And then finally, you'll need to have the port and protocol that you'll want to do uh, the load balancing for your application on. Finally, you'll create a cloud profile to bring it all together. Inside the AWS service, we'll go ahead and create a new policy. If you look at the policy I have currently, I have a couple actions added to my Citrix node policy. Basically, that's the auto scale SNS and SQS features. When I log into the VPX for the first time, notice that I'm brought to the configuration screen, and this is by design. What we're showing here is NetScaler has already detected that there are VIPs available, and if I click the drop down, I can see what IP addresses have been exposed from the IAM interface. Looking over at my CloudWatch portal, I can see that there are different IP addresses available and that does line up. For autoscale groups, I've also received the same information. So basically what I'm doing in NetScaler is choosing the VIP and the scale group from AWS itself. Now notice at the bottom here, we have a feature called Graceful. Graceful means what happens when a load is decreased and we need to decommission a server. In this case, I'm choosing to gracefully drain a server once its load has dropped. And what that means is that when the server has less of a load under the exchange group, then when Amazon removes that server, it will tell NetScaler to do so first. If you take a look here, I have four service group members in my um, auto scale group currently. So first we'll go under the auto scale group and we'll create an alarm. And this alarm is basically signaling um, to the NetScaler when a new server is available or is needed. In this case, I'm saying that when the CPU is above 70%, we'll create an alarm. 
And what that does is it says, hey, a, uh, Amazon, I need a new server instance. And what I'm configuring here is to spin up one new instance anytime the average CPU for the service group is above 70. Similarly, we need a scale down policy. And in this case, what we're doing is we're creating a policy just to notify the NetScaler that we no longer need the extra server. Notice here that we're sending a notification to the queue. And what we're doing is we're actually just notifying the NetScaler that an action is required. In this case, for the scale down, the NetScaler itself will notify Amazon that the server is no longer needed when uh, finally all the connections have drained for it. Pay attention to the action here. If I remove one instance in the scale policy, that means my Graceful is disabled on NetScaler. To support graceful draining, we tell Amazon not to take an action, but just notify NetScaler. Now over on my server, I'm starting up a process, and I'm just doing this to create an artificial high load on the server to demonstrate the purpose or the feature of auto-scaling. So when I run this process, the CPU load will now spike on the server, and Amazon will pick up that change. So now if I switch back over to the CloudFormation portal, and we look at the monitor on the portal, we can see that there's now a spike shown for the server. Now if I go under the activity history, you can see that there's actually a server being spun up and is in progress because the portal has detected and shot off an alarm to say, hey, we've got a high CPU and we need more servers. Now looking at my NetScaler config, I had three servers. And now if you look closely at the bottom part of the screen, I now have four servers. In fact, the fourth server is in the state of, pro or in the process of still coming up, so it's still showing in the down condition. Now to show auto scale down, I'm going to kill the process for the CPU. Because we're a little short on time, I'm gonna skip to, uh, to a, a couple other things. Um, one thing I, I do wanna touch on before, before we even really move much further, um, he doesn't mention the actual spinning up of the NetScaler. Um, the, the power that you get with AWS and, and NetScaler with um, CloudFormation templates lets you get to about where this video starts in, well, I've spun up an HA pair in four minutes and 30 seconds. Um, so I, I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't do that manually. Um, so CloudFormation templates really give you that, that strength so that you can go through and you know, pick your subnets, where do you want it? It's going to go ahead and auto assign a uh, um, SNP, a, uh, a VIP, and then the NSIP, and you can pick which subnets you want that in, and it's going to spin up the, the two net scalers for you. Um, and then, really, at that point, you can log in, and if you've already got an auto scale group built, you can go ahead and, and select that, give it the VIP, and you're, you're on your way. So, it really is a powerful tool to, to be able to leverage NetScaler and AWS together um, to, to really have that scalability and, um, and agility. So, um, yeah, we can go ahead and... Let's see where we're at. I think, um, yeah, we've got... We've only got like two minutes yeah. left, so... I wanted uh, to just mention there's, if you are using the ELB low balancer, there's a new feature um, called uh, advanced GSLB. So as you know, there's domain in domain based, um, uh, it, you know, in the cloud for ELB, but your VIPs are on prem. So as your low, low balancing layers are, are scaling, um, your IP is not going to be static. So we have um, NetScaler GSLB domain based service groups, and you can do this with auto scaling. So um, please check that out. That's going to really help you as well. Um, you know, make NetScaler more cloud native. Yeah. So, um, yeah, do's, do's and don'ts. Um, do go ahead and take the time to, if you're not comfortable with NMAS, go ahead and get comfortable with it. But um, I would definitely say make sure that, um, that, that you leverage some of the tools, right? The, the little cavemen are prime examples. Don't be too busy to learn something that's going to make your life a lot easier. Like I mentioned, cloud formation templates, let me spin up a, a, an HA pair of net scalers in four and a half minutes. That's a huge win. If I didn't take the time to learn how a cloud formation template works and lets me, lets me work more efficiently, that, that could have never happened. So definitely take the time to learn how Stylebooks work, how NMAS works, um, and, and all of kind of the infrastructure as code pieces come together um, because that will, you know, can you do it without it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but 
you know, as we've had some questions already, doing it manually and doing it the old old fashioned way is uh, is painful. Um, so, yeah, learn from the cavemen. Use a wheel. <laughs> and then just one last thing. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, Netscaler VPX is in the AWS marketplace. We have an express version so that you can go ahead and do this with no license file, no cost, no commitment. Go ahead and you know, go in there right now and, and try that out. Um, so that we've really lowered the barrier for you to, to start with that. Yeah. And the um, CloudFormation template for that VPX is actually available as well yes. on the marketplace and on, on GitHub. GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're also not comfortable with CloudFormation templates, it's actually a really good way to kind of go through there and learn what, um, what, what Citrix has already done with CloudFormation templates and kind of be able to port that over to, uh, even, even if it's just a matter of creating a CloudFormation template for your own EC2 instances, for example. Yeah. Um, being able to kind of dissect that uh, helped me learn a lot. Um, so. so yeah, I mean, we have a, a bunch of resources. You're going to be able to get the uh, presentation, I believe, around uh, the 20th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you'll be able to find these links and resources in there. Um, again, we have the links to, to GitHub and everything for you. Please rate the session. Um, and there you go. Uh, you know, if you provide feedback uh, by a certain date there, you get a $20 Amazon gift card. Um, and please come up and talk to us. I don't believe we have time for questions, but we'll be off to the side or, or right outside the doors there if you do have questions or want to have a further discussion. Thank you so much.